Hello and welcome. This is National Master Steve Colding for Chess for Children. And we would like to welcome you to our video, our newest one, Crushing the Scotch Game. And this video has everything. It has history. It has great moves. It has a game by me. Oh, you lucky people. And most of all, it has a contest in which you could win a classic book at the end. Oh, you're so lucky. I hope you have fun in this uh, video. It took us a while to do, and it's something new. Anyway, uh, welcome again, and thank you for participating. This is Crushing the Scotch Game, and now let's get to work. The history of the Scotch game begins in Moderna, Italy, around 1750. It is first mentioned in the book, Practical Observations on the Game of Chess by an anonymous Modernese author. We know that this book analyzed and recommended the Scotch game, and we also know that its anonymous author was, in fact, Domenico Incole del Rio. Del Rio, known as the Devil Who Never Loses, was part of a triad of masters in Moderna known as the Modernanese School. They believed in gambits, rapid development, and spatial advantages. The other two masters were Domenico Lorenzo Panziani of the Panziani opening and John Battista Lolly, who has a group of checkmates named after him. The first example of the Scotch game actually being played occurred between two French generals. The first general, who had the black pieces, was named Bertrand, and the second general, you might have heard of him, was a guy named Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon was a great general and had once been the Emperor of France. But he and his army had been defeated at Waterloo, and now he was forced by his enemies to retreat to the island of St. Helena, where he spent the rest of his life. In his spare time, Napoleon played chess with his loyal general Bertrand. And here is the game. So, if the Scotch game was first written about by Italians and first played by French, then why do we call it the Scotch game? It's the name that goes by any other word would smell as sweet. The Scotch game got its name from a famous match between two chess clubs in 1824. The upstart Edinburgh Chess Club, established two years earlier, had the nerve to challenge the powerful London club. All the experts said London would win easily. The match took four years, but surprisingly went to the Scottish club, and the Scotch opening had an important role. You can visit the Edinburgh Club today in Scotland at 1 Alva Street in Edinburgh, UK. The trophy that they had won for the match can still be seen in their trophy case. If you would like to know more about the Edinburgh Chess Club or the match that they played or the games that they played, you can visit their website at www.edinburghchessclub.co.uk.
In the 19th century, the Scotch was very popular, netting some very, very interesting wins. In the 20th century, when defense was better understood, white spatial advantage was thought to be easily dealt with, with black's developmental advantage. Yes, if white develops in the normal, classical way, black's time edge easily compensates for white's spatial advantage. But time marches on, and at the end of the 20th century, there came a man who turned theory on its head in his 1990 match with Anatoly Karpov, the 13th world champion Gary Kasparov, reintroduced in the 14th game of the match, the Scotch game. His idea on the 10th move of the Mises variation, which comes out of the Schmidt, G3 was an improvement from the again Mises Titan from 1895. Even though that game ended in a draw, he played it again and in the 16th game won a long battle on the 102nd move. And since that time, Gary Kasparov has used the Scotch opening as a weapon against the greatest players of our age. If you would like to know more about the 1990 match and see the games that in the 14th and 16th where Kasparov uh, reintroduces the Scotch, this is a great book to have. The book is called Five Crowns and is written by Grandmaster Yasser Sarawan and International Master Jonathan Tisdale. It's really a great book and a good addition to your library. Alex Bryant, rated 22.59, versus Stephen Colding, rated 22.19, the Chicago Open 2016 under 2300 section, 6th round. After the moves e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, and e takes d4, we are now at a crossroads for white. White's three most popular systems at this point are bishop to c4, which is the scotch gambit, c3, which is the goring gambit, and the move he played in the game, which is knight takes d4, which makes it a proper scotch game. Now black has a wider range of choices. They are Knight takes d4, which is dubious because black exchanges his only piece and brings white's queen out powerfully to the center. Queen f6, queen h4, the Steinitz variation, which wins a pawn by force at the cost of uh, development disadvantage. Knight f6, the Schmidt variation, which was considered the main line and the choice of many strong players like uh, Karpov, Fen, and An. Bishop to c5, the choice that is made in this game, and it's called the classical variation, and knight on g to e7, and bishop to b4 check. These are the choices that black has. My choice against Alex was bishop to c5, the classical variation. Classical variation suits my style of quick development. When white played b4, he played it and made black give up his central outpost. This ensures white will have a spatial advantage and will have freer movement to operate with his pieces. The trade-off for that is that black gets better development. Hence, white has space, and black has time. Okay, white's choices in this position are knight to f5, knight takes c6, knight to b3, and the choice that Alex made, and the most popular, bishop to e3. 
which threatens to play knight takes c6, winning the bishop at c5. The game continued, queen f6, c3, knight on g to e7, and now Alex had the choice between the two main moves, g3 or bishop to c4. He chose bishop to c4. The two main moves in this position for black are knight to e5, with knight to e5 being the better move, or queen to g6. Both of these are what the usual theory recommends, but I had something new to discover, and I had seen a game with Geary, and he had played the move b6. When I looked at the move, I was astonished at how much sense it made. It protected the bishop at c5, prepared to play the white square bishop to its best diagonal, the a8h1 diagonal, and then it prepared an attack on the e pawn, which is white's most natural weakness. It also kept open the possibility of castling on either side, depending on the situation. When I played this move, my opponent raised his eyebrows as a surprise. I took this as a good sign. My opponent, who up until this point had been moving very quickly, now sat down to a very deep think. The choices he had were knight takes e6, knight to a3, b4, and castle. Castle was the move that he chose. Right here, I play bishop to b7, but it may not be the best. White can reply knight to b3, f4, knight to c6, or b4. Knight to b3 looks to be the most challenging. Black cannot capture at e3. This actually happened in a few master games. And he brings the f-file for the rook and attacks the f7 pawn with both the bishop and the rook, resulting in black's king being in the middle of the board and his rooks unconnected. Knight to e5 is the answer, which results in a complicated position with chances for both sides. Also, knight to b5 looks dangerous, but black can defend successfully with castle, bishop takes c5, b takes c5, queen a4, a6, knight on b to a3, and knight to e5 with a nice position. The safer move other than bishop b7 is castle. Would I choose it next time? I don't know. I guess it will depend on how I feel. In the book The Scotch Game by Yelambo Dembo and Richard Pilsner, they mention b6 and go over three lines, b4, f4, and knight to b5. You can pick the book up on Amazon.com. Alex, however, chose none of these options and came up with a novelty, the move f3. I believe this move is not dynamic enough. On the surface, it seems reasonable to shore up the e4 pawn, but here, he places his knight in a pin, and that limits his options of moving the d4 knight. After f3 and taking into account my opponent's long think, I chose to play for the break of d5 as soon as possible. So now I play castle's queenside. At this point I had used 78 of my allotted 120 minutes. My opponent now played queen to d2, which protects the bishop and threatens bishop g5. Or does it? In actual fact, this move is too passive again, and he should have played b4 according to the machines. I now took the opportunity and, and closed my eyes and played d5. My opponent then continued with e takes d5, which now guarantees me an advantage 
Here, he should apply bishop b3 or the bishop anywhere else except this. He goes along with my plans and he opens the position and now my position is totally free and all my pieces have lots of scope. He was counting on his bishop to g5 move. At this move, my opponent had used 90 minutes and I had used 5 minutes less. So my opponent has gotten in his bishop to g5, skewering my queen versus my rook. And it looks like he might win the exchange, but in actual fact, it's I who win material. And I'll give you a second to think about what move I did. Take your time, stop the video. Okay, the move that I did do, and the move that came at him like a thunderbolt, was knight takes d4. National Master Bayan now played King to h1, which came as a surprise to me. Uh, King h1 is the only way to maintain chances. If white plays bishop to f6, then comes knight to f3 discovered check. The king moves to h1, knight takes queen, bishop takes rook, knight takes bishop, bishop to h4, Knight on d5 to e3, rook to f2, knight takes g2, rook takes g2, and knight to e3 leads to a big material advantage. And if white just plays c takes d4, then queen takes d4 check, queen takes queen, bishop takes queen, king to h1, bishop to b2, bishop takes d8, king d8, knight d2, bishop takes a1, rook to a1, and knight to e3 is decisive. This ends part one of Crushing the Scotch. Now we're going to talk about the contest. In the contest, we, it starts after we receive 100 likes for the video. Then you enter the answers in the comments below of the next three moves. Be right and be first, and then you win. Of course, employees and anyone I showed this game to is ineligible. Don't worry, it's a small amount. What you win is your own personal copy of the Five Crowns book written by Jonathan Tisdale and Yasser Serwa. The def definitive guide that is selling for upwards of $60 on eBay and Amazon. We will also pay shipping and handling. So, to recap, after 100 likes, the contest begins. Enter your answers in the comments below for the next three moves. Be right and be first, and then you win. We hope you enjoyed this video. Leave your comments, good or bad, below. Like us if you are so inclined, and subscribe. This is National Master Steve Colvin for Chess for Children. Chess for Children, where we make children smarter, is saying so long until next time.